Keep Bye, going. Everyone. Thank you very much. The end of the 1998 World Cup finals in France and the end of Jimmy Hill's 50th season in professional football. For 20 years, he was a player and a manager. The other 30, he became most famously a football pundit, a job he invented and one for which, even at 70, he was still somehow perfectly adapted. He said to me, who's your favourite, who's your favourite player? I said, well, it's Pelé. Pelé. <laughs> I said, well, who's yours? He said, well, me, isn't it? Me. And he, said, he means it. I mean, he still lacks a bit of confidence. He said, he said Pelé may have scored 2,000 goals at the highest level, but that's all he did. I've often been in a situation where I'm typing a script out for the show and, and, and there's a bit of a deadline and Jimmy will come up to you and he said, I was on the third uh, the other day at the Berkshire and I've got this part for 20 feet and I've got, and I said, yeah, Jim, I'll, uh, in, in a sec, because uh, I'm just, I must knock this out. No, but you see, I've got to tell you, because my grip, you see, my grip was round that way and I pulled it round and I've sunk it and I've, I'm, I'm three under after five. Let me tell you, just let me finish, the statistics of those open goal chances and if you put your arm up, you and are you risk having a penalty. If I'd have been the manager and all of a sudden with Gascoigne looking as if he'd been rejuvenated, suddenly an unfit man who was playing no part mentally as well as physically became a dynamo. What, 20 minutes was yeah. it? I mean, in 600 seconds of football, he got those two that's chances. That's 10 minutes. Yeah, that's 10 minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, but he was... uh, I do know that uh, times on television, people viewing me, um, get a false impression, I think, of what I really am. The standard caricature of Jimmy Hill doesn't depict him as a father of five, nor a wedding artist, the veteran of three marriages. And in football, he's better known now as a talker than a doer. Yet many features of the modern game owe themselves to Hill, who always was ambitious. I would like to be a dictator and manage all 92 league clubs and, and, and make the directors do what is good for the game in the future. Uh, I, I think that would be marvellous. Hill grew up in South London. Like so many small boys, his head was filled with dreams of sport and dictatorship. He played football for his school and the boys' brigade, encouraged by his mother and his father, a baker. In 1950, after national service, he was able to avoid becoming a stockbroker by signing for second division Brentford, These weren't lucrative times for a professional footballer. Hill earned seven pounds a week, and in the absence of a multi-million pound shampoo contract, picked up extra money as a chimney sweep. There is an art, you know, an art in chimney sweeping, just as there is in trying to score a goal for Brentford. Um, but I knew more about one than I knew about the other, and there were times when we got the damn thing stuck. Go like this and go like that. Go and you know, in June or July, sweat pouring off us. But it was all part of the insecurity that I felt as a professional footballer, because the day, we were all frightened of the day, when the day would come when you no longer could earn your living uh, from those skills. And then, what do you do after that? Hill, perhaps unsurprisingly, disagreed with his manager at Brentford and was transferred to Fulham, where he continued to hone skills which would later prove useful. So while Hill tries to tell the referee his job, and no doubt will be spoken to by the referee for that bit of nonsense from Jimmy Hill. Teeing it up for Haynes. This was a golden phase for Fulham. Hill played and argued with referees alongside the great Johnny Haynes, George Cohen and Bobby Robson. Jimmy, like, he was always demanding and asking and talking for the ball and shouting for the ball. And uh, he was, I think, shouting to Georgie Cohen about to give him the ball. And a wag in the terrace shouted, you know, when the rabbi asks for the ball, give it to him. So, yeah, yeah, he had a nickname. Rabbi. No. Yeah. That's the classic Joseph calls, wasn't it? Give, it? give it to the rabbi, Cohen. We had Georgie Cohen playing right fullback for us. The crowd used to say, give it to the rabbi, Cohen. <laughs> and the lovely pass to Haynes, now to Hill. And Haynes to Key, and the lovely move by Fulham. And a goal, oh, what a mistake by Dunlop. With respect, he wasn't uh, a great technical player, but he was a very hard-working player. He was tremendously fit. Jimmy could cover every metre of grass in 90 minutes and three times over. He loved to score goals. 
which he did from time to time. And when he did score goals, I mean, you couldn't touch him. Chamberlain for Fulham, the side that has created the sensation by rattling the cup holders and now leading, now drawing three all. Chamberlain getting through. The goal, there's Jezard. It's a goal. It's You weren't, you don't mind me saying, the greatest player in the world, but you're not bothered about slagging everyone else off, are you? <laughs> I suppose now he's looked upon as the, as, as the elder statesman, um, but every so often he will come up with a couple of lines that make people think, hang on, didn't we think this fellow was past it? No, he's not. You still, were playing an injured not, player? No, I would, I I would, still, well, I, I would go with him. And I think that the players would feel that uh, even a half-fit uh, Ronaldo might do something. As, as a manager, particular would you put an injured man on the field to start any game? Yep. If it was Ronaldo, I yes. Would. Or a player like him. Yes, I yeah. would. And if he's got a point to make, he doesn't waver off it. He will push and push and push and say, sorry, but that's what... I mean, actually, he probably won't say sorry. That is what I think and he'll stick with it. That's a £30 million player and a risk of damaging an ankle that might ruin so his whole career. Yeah, there's there's, 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 there's no more important final. game, is there, than a World Cup final? Does that mean you write off his career at his no, age? I don't think he would even would. think that about writing off his career. Now, but if you're the manager, you're, you're, you're actually... taking an enormous risk. The manager what is the benefit? You tell me what the benefit is, having watched oh, that half. Obviously. Obviously there isn't. Tell what the benefit obviously is. Obviously there isn't a keeper. He lifted his foot up and let the ball come. So he dummied his own goalkeeper. He wouldn't have left that goal on purpose there, Jim. I mean, there's no way you can have it. As I no, but I don't think he let it go. I mean, he's not going to let it go. Hope the goalkeeper's going to get it. He, he misjudged his... it. What is taking your foot out of the way of it? No, then? I don't think he did. I'd be getting the taxi the next day, and the taxi drivers would say, "Oh, that was good last night." Or, or what is it? Why did he say that? You really don't like that Jimmy Hill, do you? And I used to say, "Yeah, I do actually." I, I do. No, you don't. No, you don't like him. I say, "No, I really do like." You don't like? All right, I don't like him. He said, "I knew you didn't." <laughs> I mean, they just didn't like the idea of us getting on well. <laughs> the public love two um, so-called pundits falling out with each other, and especially if they do it uh, reasonably well and not idiotically, you know, and, but nevertheless passionately. The way he says passion, you know, I'm sure some of the ladies watching at home will get quite the wrong meaning from that, but I know exactly what you mean. What do you know about <laughs> passion? Says, you know, well, I know when he says it, it's, it's uh, quite enticing. It, it reminds you, does it? It reminds <laughs> me of days gone by. <laughs> long, long time ago. <laughs> that, was his, that was his biggest week. Women. <laughs> Women. <laughs> Every woman was a spur film star to him. <laughs> well, finally, Miss Rackle Welsh. I'm sure that uh, you all have known that all the, during the week she's been talking about her liking for football and her admiration in particular for Chelsea. So it's a bit of a scoop for the big match because we've brought them together. And who should be the lucky fella who can do it for us? Of course, Jimmy Hill. He's, standing He's trying to stop the goalkeeper coming out one way. And in the end, you see, he makes him kick it off his weak foot. See, he makes the goal. Oh, go the way. I see that. Well, he I didn't know. Right I didn't players. understand that tra that strategy. But see, now, now there show that shows you where you have to have brains, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's just thought in the middle of the game. You know, this is a, a women's lib program I, now. The first oh, woman to appear oh, ever on our program. Oh, stop! I'm not women's you know lib. If the women knew what woman. the hell they were doing, they'd be down here watching this game and enjoying it, oui. watching all these lovely men doing, you know, wonderful athletic things. I enjoy women's company. Um, I love flirting with them. Why not? Um, but not dangerously these days. <laughs> so you get, you get the benefit of the flirting without the, the, the uh, consequences which tend to be very embarrassing. <laughs> I think she's wonderful, don't you? I think all the girls are wonderful. And uh, could we cheer the losers because we're not used to losing in Coventry, but we do feel very sorry for them. Jimmy Hill, see all, hear all and know all. <laughs> This, an expert on that, and an expert on the other. <laughs> Jimmy Hill is a man of action. He needs to be fit, and fitness and leisure meet in horse riding. He took it up only a year ago. He bought a horse, was taught by an expert, and promptly rode to hound. Like everything else he does, he does it well. I said to him, what we want to do, Jimmy, is we get, find your nice little horse. As you can go, well, I found one from I happened to have it in the yard, which all dealers do, you know. And when Jimmy went out, 
he wanted to win. And when we went hunting, we had to be first. Nobody else could beat us. Once or twice, he jumped on the back of me, you know, and I turned around and gave him a bit of language. Whoops! It was always, whoops, sorry, Ted. I said, for God's sake, keep it back a bit. Just, just, just give a couple of lengths, you know, but not Jimmy, keep going, you know. He'd keep coming up there in case he get left, in case he got lost, you know. I love being in the country. As someone who was born in Ballam, um, you know, middle of London, and not knowing really what a farm was or, you know, about horses in any kind of way, uh, it, was, it was a magical experience for me uh, to follow Ted over fences. 1974, and Hill, in the yellow, approaches the first at Aintree. All right. All right. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. Steady. Not for the first time, Jimmy Hill is about to get carried away. Steady, boy. Find out. Whoa. Steady, boy. Steady, lad. Steady, boy. Steady. Steady. Steady, lad. Steady, boy. Steady, lad. Come on. Whoa. <coughs> Steady, boy. In 1994, Hill called Eric Cantona despicable for a stamping incident. What Alex Ferguson called Jimmy Hill made bigger news. He called me a prat. Um... And I know, I know only too well, what really upset me about it was that I know only too well the pressure he's under. Even a winning manager is under pressure. And especially during those moments after the game. We hate Jimmy Hill! He's a poo! He's a poo! It's very strange, you know, it's really changed over the years, you know, because uh, at the start there was a real antagonism towards Jimmy Hill, you know. He, his attitude towards the Scots really was, uh, you know, dismissive was being positive about it, I think. I look upon Scotland as part of the British Empire, as it were. You know, he's brought up as a kid and we had all that pink on the map. We used to look and say, isn't it marvellous? You know, look, we own all this. <laughs> it's gradually receded as the years have gone on, but I, I hope that Scotland's still with us. <laughs> and the same with Ireland. And, and it, that isn't just affectation. That's the way I was brought up as a kid. I mean, people are very black and white about Jimmy. There's no grey. You know, you either like James or you know, on the box, I mean, or you don't like James, you know. When you could call me opinionated is when um, I'm involved in a subject about which I'm absolutely certain I'm right. Uh, um, yeah, and then you could say I'm very stubborn and, and won't be shifted and will use any argument that I can find to prove a case. Uh, that was fortunate, you know, for Alan Shearer. <laughs> highest paid footballer probably in the country at the moment, that I was as stubborn on, on one particular case, and that was getting rid of the maximum wage. Do you think you'll ever play for England? I don't know, I don't know, I can't tell really. Are you hoping to? Oh, I'd like to, yeah. What would you be doing if you weren't going to be playing football all your life? Oh, I have no idea, that's, uh, that's, all, I've, that's all I can do. As a youngster, I was maybe 17, just side the professional, came the time when the maximum wage was uh, abolished of which uh, Cliff Lloyd and Jim, Jimmy Hill, were big, big players. Well, the, the two main players in that. Mr. Jimmy Hill is president of the Professional Footballers Association. Mr. Hill, how many members are there of the Football Players Association of which you are the chairman? Um, about 2,500. And does that cover all the players in the Football League? Um, pretty well, all of them, I should think. There was a feeling of being serfs. You know, there was a feeling of being manipulated and you were lesser people than those that were employing you. I can go into a theatre and with my name on a bill I can draw the crowds. But a footballer has to have ten people helping him. And remember, the people that run football make nothing at all out of it. I would say that my football costs me personally about £5,000 a year. Football boomed in the 1950s. A second division match could pull crowds of 30,000, all wearing the obligatory cap. Money was flooding in, but where was it going? Not to the players, on a maximum wage of £20 per week and growing restless. After all, star players such as Tom Finney, Stanley Matthews, Johnny Haynes, these boys bring a terrific crowd to the game every week. If they don't play, the 7 or 8,000 spectators won't turn up. If Danny Kay plays at Palladium, comes to the Palladium, he gets £2,000. <laughs> 
players who are led by Jimmy Hill, chairman of the Professional Footballers Association, demand a freer contract, a bigger wage, and a guaranteed share of transfer fees. Why don't you go on strike if you've got all the players in your union? It isn't our intention to go on strike because uh, there's a phrase, softly, softly, catchy monkey, which is perhaps our maxim. Well, of course, uh, they're pressing for more money for star players, but what they've got to face is this, that if the star player gets more than there is in the, uh, in the kitty to share out amongst players, then inevitably there must be unemployment amongst players, or, or a lot of players will get a lot less. If that's not quite good enough, then will the players get more or not, do you suppose? That I couldn't say. Then you go to a meeting and meet your opponents, as it were, the members of the management committee of the Football League, uh, and then you see uh, something that you don't like at all. And, and the way in which they were treating players and the way in which the secretary of the league, Alan Hardacre, looked down his nose at professional players, that set, set up a kind of inner rage. Suddenly it's ob obsessing my mind all the time. How can we win? How can we win? If uh, the thing isn't resolved satisfactorily, uh, soon after August the 31st, then they will withdraw their labour. The face-off lasted a week. Football went into limbo. Ticket sales were suspended. Pools promoters got ready to stage stand-in fixtures in parks. On Wednesday, the 18th of January, 1961, after a meeting lasting four hours, Jimmy Hill's finest four hours, the league backed down. The strike was off, and players were free to earn wages in line with their pulling power. I had had an offer from Italy to go abroad, obviously, if I was getting £20 a week over here and big wages in Italy, I was going to go to Italy. And Tommy Trindle said, there's no way we'll let them go. We'd even pay them £100 a week if the maximum wage was lifted. And then, of course, it was lifted. So, <laughs> so Tommy was uh, lumbered, as they say. <laughs> it's all very well looking at it now when professional footballers are very strong and the PFA is very, very strong. But in those days, you know, it was very, very different. And he had to be, he had to be, he had to be confident, he had to be strong. And uh, you have to be brave, you know. Do you feel that you've achieved all that you've been fighting for over the months? Well, I wouldn't say we've achieved all. I mean, I don't think we'd ever have settled it if we, if we achieved everything. That we, there would have been a strike and I don't know what would have happened. But I think we've achieved more or less the things that are going to benefit football. I really enjoyed that period, but obviously that was why Jimmy was uh, such a, a big name at the time. He would say it's because he was a great footballer, but I I'm not sure. <laughs> but by opening the door for his profession, Hill had closed the door on his own career. I was the peak, but in a strange kind of way, um, I fell off two pinnacles at once, if you like. I couldn't play on because my knee had got badly damaged in the last season with Fulham. And I'd already stated that I believed that the chairman of the PFA should be a current player. So having imposed that principle on the PFA, all I had to do was to abide by it. I've got to earn. And at the end of two hours, we had an empty bottle of gin, and we had, let's all sing together, play up Sky Blues, while you sing together, you'll never lose. And I, I love the fact that they still sing it on the terraces now, in the premiership. It was six years of tremendous excitement and fun, and Jimmy, I found was the best manager I've ever known or ever likely to know. Coventry were promoted as champions in 1967. They've been in the top division ever since. Well done, Jimmy Hill. Well done, Coventry City. Well, Jimmy, you've shaken Coventry pretty rigid today by this decision. Now, uh, why are you leaving Coventry and what are you going to do? Well, why I'm leaving Coventry because I've decided to give up football management. All I was asking for was a 10-year contract. And uh, Derek Robbins, the chairman, um, not for any uh, unpleasant reasons, but had seen two 10-year contracts in football not work. I, I think my own personal feeling is that he had already, through Bagdell Harvey, who was, with whom he was very close and a partner, by the way, had already arranged um, a contract with ITV. To this day, he still believes that I had another offer waiting, could I, couldn't wait to get out. That's not true, it didn't. Um, I didn't meet Michael Peacock, the manager, uh, managing director of London Weekend Television, until three weeks after I had publicly announced that I, would, I was leaving Coventry. I think that uh, 
that he was terribly intelligent to go into into the media and to finish with management. He knew that he, 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 could, he did very well. He changed the stadium and uh, he had a good football team. Uh, reasonably successful too. And, uh, but he knew when to get out of it, I think. It, it's, it's a business that uh, is uh, devastating, actually. I found out that even when you're successful, you know, you, you can't succeed all the time. This man we looked up to and we respected so, so much. And uh, I, I could get very emotional about the situation because I know what he's achieved for Bobby Gould. And um, that goes back a long, long way. What I'd like to thank him for is for, for what he'd done for Coventry City and for the city of Coventry. I said it, George Curtis. We carried it on. In 1967, and in another abrupt switch of direction, Hill joins LWT as head of sport. It didn't seem to trouble him that he had no previous experience. It was David and Goliath as far as uh, sport was concerned on the box. And uh, we had to make an impression uh, against the might of the BBC. ITV had nothing. And Jimmy said to me, Brian, I wonder if you fancy climbing a mountain with me. Now, I found that irresistible. He said, I want you to be the commentator, and, and so on. And he said, and I think we can get at these people. And I, I'm not that much of a competitor, but I really felt that if you want to be in the trenches with somebody, get in there with Jimmy Hill. Jimmy's interest was fantastic. He'd go off on a Saturday afternoon with Brian Moore to a football match, and he'd take with him a little portable telly. And he'd sit in the, uh, in the grandstand there, and he'd be watching Arsenal versus, you know, Chelsea, whoever. And he'd be watching World of Sport and Dickie Davis, and, you know, at the same time. And he'd keep an eye on the show, and he'd come back on Monday morning and say, well, I saw some of them, didn't like that chaps, so and what about that? And very, very, you know, hands-on. It was, it was, he was terrific. Marinello. Hill's willingness to put himself on the line took on a literal meaning one afternoon at Highbury. And who should the emergency linesman be? Jimmy Hill, and the crowd know it and recognize it. But we all said to ourselves, how many people did he kick out of the way to get first down that tunnel and get the job? The man who's put referees and linesmen under the spotlight for so long, now is truly under the spotlight himself of something like a 50,000 crowd and television as well. Football criticism on television had been fairly mealy-mouthed up until 1970. You know, it was important you said the right thing. Um, and then we came to the 1970 World Cup. And Jimmy was a party to it. John Bromley would have been another very important member uh, of this, who decided that we would have uh, a panel with a difference. We wanted one or two extroverts. It was the most terrifying football panel mankind has ever known. Crerand, Dugan, Allison, loose cannons in very loud shirts. And the viewers suddenly, there was some chemistry and some magic about these four guys. And Jimmy and Brian as sort of the kind of co-chairman. And, and off we went. And at the end of the day, these chaps worked every show. Paid them 500 pounds each. Four weeks work. <laughs> Tactically we're better, but as a, as a team in watching that, we're a complete... But why are, we tactically better? Better. why are we tactically better than in, in Europe? Better because better. we play against peasant teams who play primitive wise. Germany and Italy play with a bloody Malcolm, sweeper. Malcolm, we've had Do a lot of letters. Fight. You'll get the yellow card in a minute from <laughs> Romanians and Hungarians. No, and I'll tell you what, Jim, I couldn't care less tonight. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was... Of course, I couldn't really express myself what I felt about the Germans, you know. And Jimmy... The, the, the lads are arguing and, and they're saying, well, the Germans, they won this and they won that. And, and everybody was arguing and, and there was a pandemonium, really. We haven't cleaned up in Europe because they don't know how to play. You mean peasants in that respect, they in do, a football yeah. term? We'll yeah, make they, that quite clear. They right? don't know how to play, Jim. Yeah. They go and play with this sweeper system. This is why we won in Europe. You know, Jimmy went, a red card, Malcolm. Like, and no one ever seen a red card before, you know. And it was, it was brilliant. And I, I even shut up. <laughs> Mind you, the expenses at the hotel were quite considerable. Mr. Allison's champagne and cigars was uh, 
the manager came to me quivering after three days. He said, Mr. Bromley, have you seen the bills? Have you seen it? I said, well, don't worry, they're doing a good job. We can sort that out later. <laughs> we worked very hard, and I, I, I thought that uh, we deserved the free drinks. One of Jimmy's sort of problems, I think, to some extent, was when he was with us, that he appeared on the big match. Now, the big match only went to the, basically to the southern part of England. So when he travelled to the Midlands, and when he travelled to the north, he said, what are you doing these days, Jim? And he said, I'm on the telly. Well, they said, we never see you. He said, well, no, I'm, it's up at London weekend. We don't come all over the country. Oh, really? And that, that irked him a bit. So when the great friend of ours, Sam Leach, who was in the boss of the BBC, said, Jim, come across. And he said, I can give you an, an audience nationwide. And the old boy said, this is from me. So when the cab driver in Newcastle said, I saw you on the telly, Jim, because he loves all that. You know, but why not? I've had a postcard from a Mr. Terry Cridland, who comes from Ashford in Kent, who tells me that he spotted what you've been doing, incidentally, for the last week or so. He spotted you spotted out there. Spotted me doing what? Out there. <laughs> you've been there. <laughs> How did you get the... Where did you get the soup from? That's what... Listen, I, I'm not taking this lying down. I think that man's impersonating me. But <laughs> uh, well, we want to know, if you're doing the singles, why you don't do the doubles? In a loop. Wife wouldn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> you look like a famous commentator from really? football. Yes. Uh, I didn't a know. Mr. Jimmy Hill. Have you Mr. heard? Mr. Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jimmy Hill, Fulham's famous bearded inside right, shaving his beard off with the new Remington, the world's fastest shave. It feels um, very improper to touch at the moment, almost as if I'm touching a bare lady's bottom. Yeah, you know, not... <laughs> Or a lady's bare bottom. Or a lady's bare bottom, Which yes. Way you Either way to... you want to <laughs> touch. Who said, I can make England great again? I did. <laughs> and I will, when I finish with Saudi Arabia, Coventry City and BBC Sport. In 1976, when Prince Faisal needed a blueprint for the future of Saudi Arabian football, he sought out Jimmy Hill. It was a lucrative advisory role, but he was to lose the money later, investing in the North American Soccer League. Meanwhile, Hill was back at Coventry City, this time as managing director. Have you booked your seat yet? Enjoy all the thrills of First Division football in comfort and safety from your very own seat at the new Coventry City All-Seater Stadium. Call the Sky Blue Link Line. Coventry City. Yes, we have. We've got plenty of tickets for this evening. Give me 40, please, yeah. He was still innovating, offering half-priced tickets to the jobless and nagging the league to adopt the three points for a win system. There were less clever ideas, too. More details have emerged about the rebel football tour of South Africa. Today, Jimmy Hill, chairman of Coventry City and BBC television soccer pundit, revealed he's one of the organisers behind the tour. Hill's decision to bust the cultural boycott in 1982 and manage an all-star side on a tour of apartheid South Africa did not go down well. He was summoned to the BBC on his return to offer his apologies. Stand by, Jimmy. Stand by, studio. Jimmy can come in from the oblique side from time to time. <laughs> Do you know, that is not an idiotic idea. Well, I don't think if... if that, for them all to go yeah. blind. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you... Just listen, just listen. Just team spirit. Yeah, no, no, team spirit, but also, um, when your head's down and you're looking at a football, uh, you need a bright shirt to pass to, and your vision is that much better, right? <laughs> and a, a, a light head... This is and very you good, can laugh, You can laugh as much as you like. Split glance like that, you see a head and lay the ball to it. The tiniest 1% advantage in this game gives you a result. Thank you, Jim. But yes, he, he does like to use both hands uh, for emphasis, uh, normally about there. Uh, so <laughs> that's one thing you'll see a lot of. Um, and also, you know, he, 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 he will uh, tend to, to keep talking, really, uh, until interrupted, which is, which is no bad thing, obviously, especially if you're involved in some sort of talking competition. That is Alan Shearer, it's in the back of the net. Somebody interrupts him, normally uh, uh, Mr Hansen, of course, and he does like to use Mr Hansen sometimes as, a, as a, I get another uh, catchphrase, if you like. You see, I'm doing that thing now of not uh, 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 letting you in by keeping, making even not always words, but, uh, uh, you know, a little... Uh, <laughs> and then I've run out of things to say, so I... I laugh. <laughs> I'm playing a role there. Not that I'm acting, but nevertheless, I'm 
I'm there to talk about a particular subject uh, all the time, pretty well. And um, because I'm fascinated by, interested in it, um, very positive in some of the ideas, they uh, might look upon me as being not quite the person that I am. Um, you know, if you walk through the front door and sit down and have a cup of tea. I think Jimmy does get hurt. I think he's a sensitive, he's an intelligent guy. He's a sensitive man and, and, and he does get hurt by things. That a, but he always defends his corner. He abs I've been in restaurants with him where some fool who's had too much to drink will challenge him. Jimmy won't pass by. He won't walk on the other side of the street. Jimmy will take this person on and 99 times out of 100, that guy will go away thinking that he has lost the day, for sure. One Sunday morning, uh, Everton were playing Liverpool, and we're going around the track, and it was packed. I mean, it was really packed. The three of us walking around, which is always a little embarrassing, because you know you're going to get some stick. But it was Jim who got it. And the whole crowd of yous and shout out. <laughs> Hope you're watching this, Jim. <laughs> shout out. Jimmy, he was a wanker. Jimmy, he was a wanker. He said, there's fame for you. They love me here. <laughs> it's a sad sign, but whenever there is any trouble on the terraces, especially involving England fans, you, you kind of can predict that that's going to happen sometimes. And you can also predict that when Jim is talked to about it, he will always say, well, I think it's a society problem. It's not football's problem, it's a society problem. And there's really nothing that football can do about it. It's a disease of our society, basically. He'll say, and, and I think that that's important for football uh, as a whole. And he'll frequently say, for the game uh, as a whole. Uh, that's one of his favourites. Taking the game as a whole, Wimbledon certainly made a very basic football error by allowing Manchester United to score more goals than they did, because that meant that they lost the game. And as a man of your experience will know, Des, they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to do that. They didn't want to do that. <laughs> Indeed, they should have ensured that they scored more goals than they let in, thereby winning the game and not losing it, because losing games in football is not something they wanted to do. Winning, yes. Losing, you don't want to do that. I'm glad to see I finally met someone of a like mind. This is secure. Unusual. GD. GD. Gold digger. Jimmy Dill. <laughs> Jimmy, <laughs> Why don't you sing? 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 I'll, I'll go on the front. Oh, I'll, I'll like go in the it. bit in the middle. Isn't I'll go in the bit in front. Of <laughs> Isn't that good? Isn't that what? Right, look at that. What an act. What an act. I've never known him lost for words in any circumstances. Even when he was ill, he talked about it to his friends openly, told you the details and all the rest of it. Fascinating because Jimmy, being Jimmy, learned all about it. In 1991, Hill developed cancer of the bowel. He made a full recovery, but in all was unwell for nearly two years. He never allowed his illness to become public, and he continued to work. It's the uncertainty of the situation and the lack of knowledge. You don't really know what's happening to you, uh, especially as I wasn't feeling ill. I mean, that was the, uh, that's probably the strange part about it. You know, most people who, when obviously given news of some kind like that, would um, be receiving it because, um, you know, they were feeling down in, in a, one way or another. I wasn't feeling down at that time. Um, just symptoms which indicated further trouble. Jimmy not only worked, he played golf, he played tennis, he did all these sporting things that he's always done while he was going through these various treatments and uh, showed, I think, the kind of courage I would love to have about a tenth of if I found myself in the same situation. I mean, I'm not very comfortable talking about it now, although I want to talk about it because I want to say to people, it isn't the end of the world if you get cancer. You know, uh, surgeons are marvelous. Um, there is help out there. So, you know, get yourself together, um, let them do their stuff, and uh, you might win a match or two. It's little known about Hill that he sometimes writes poetry. His wife, Bryony, has borne the brunt of it with remarkable courage. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> you, you were beautiful and everyone loved you. I was just talented. <coughs> Love in abundance, modest Morris. 
<laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Would you like my scarf? And he made a present to me of his Scottish scarf, which I accepted and said, thank you very much indeed. And then another guy, totally unconnected with him, walked up afterwards, also a member of the Scottish uh, Supporters Club, as it were, who went <coughs> and spat <laughs> right into my face. The reaction when I went on as Jim with the full makeup was it was actually quite quite unnerving, and I had to work very hard to get people to on my side because initially it was like that's Jimmy Hill, and we don't like Jimmy Hill because he said that about Neri, and we've never forgotten, you know. And and suddenly I was doing all this stuff, and I could feel, you know, the, the sort of uh, ill will, if you like. But as I say, I think now that's all water uh, well under the uh, uh, under the bridge. I think Jimmy Hill himself knows uh, the fact that. I wouldn't go so far to say that he was dear to their hearts, but uh, it's certainly the case that uh, there was a serious antagonism, maybe in the 70s against Jimmy, but uh, that's gone away now, and it's all wrapped up in the parody of Jimmy Hill and wrapped up in the light-heartedness and the humour of the Scottish fans. David Neary will be um, one of the sort of words on my grave, I think, on my tombstone. <laughs> From someone who... Uh, the whole nation thought I was insulting. Wouldn't I was very pleased he scored. Yeah, but of course he upsets people, Jimmy. I mean, he spent his life upsetting people. Um, and, uh, but that's part of him. And a few years ago when there was a little debate here about, you know, everybody, everybody was looking at everybody's talent and all the rest of it. And I said, well, look, we've got a ton of heroes in this business. Jimmy's our villain in a way. You know, you can't have good guys without the occasional bad guy. And, uh, and Jimmy has played the sort of bad guy in, in many ways. And he is much loved, but much disliked, uh, but never ignored. If he'd allowed McManaman a freer role in the centre, he'd have opened up his options for Fowler, because Fowler was in the best Jimmy, position... Jimmy, be quiet, will you? Also, Collymore could break through the Spurs defence. <laughs> you won't get it better than that <laughs> yeah, 109 times. <laughs> but one of the things that I do enjoy, as you'll realise, is having a laugh at myself. When do you do that? <laughs> Watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only Give us a blast, Jim. <laughs> Shall I blow it? I mean, you won't go. Yeah. <laughs>